I think you can go in the army, you can be a reasonable sort of a person, and they beat you to pulp, and then they reform you. You then you're sort of reshaped. You then become a soldier. But if you are an infantry soldier, you are taught with a gun and an edged weapon to go and kill somebody, and you don't really. You just do it. I, I can't explain why. You just go and do it. I think every single man should have had some sort of screening when you come back out of a war zone. I think that should have been in place. It wasn't as though we wasn't ready to go to war. We, everyone was fully prepared. It was coming home that people wasn't ready for. If I could have the physical removed, I think I could deal with the mental. Because I'd still feel strong, whereas I feel broken and weak. More so for admitting that I've got a mental problem. And there has been stigma in the past of people that will think you're weak because you have a mental problem. And I hate them for it. We are the not dead. In battle, life would not say goodbye to us, and crackshot snipers seem to turn a blind eye to us. And even though guns and grenades let fly at us, we somehow survived. We are the not dead. When we were young and fully alive for her, we worshipped Britannia. We, the undersigned, put our names on the line for her. From the day we were born, we were loaded and primed for her. Prepared as we were, though, to lie down and die for her, we somehow survived. So why did she cheat on us? Didn't we come running when she most needed us? When tub-thumping preachers and bullet-brained leaders gave solemn oaths and stirring speeches, and fisted the air and pointed eastwards, didn't we turn our backs on our nearest and dearest? For runways and slipways, Britannia cheered us, but returning home, she refused to meet us, sent out a crowd of backbiting jeerers and merely mouths near us. Too timing, too faced, Britannia deceived us. We're morbidly ill. Soldiers with nothing but time to kill. We idle now in everyday clothes and ordinary towns, blowing up and breaking down. If we die for cover or wake in a heap, Britannia on horseback now crosses the street or looks right through us. We seem changed and ghostly to those who knew us. The country which flew the red, white and blue for us now shows her true colours. We are the not dead, neither happy and proud with a barcode of medals across the heart, nor laid in a box and draped in a flag. We wander this no man's land instead, a creature of different stripe, the awkward, unwanted, unlovable type. Haunted with fear and guilt, wounded in spirit and mind. So what shall we do with the not dead and all of his kind? On the outside, I acted cool, calm, which is pretty much what every one of us was doing. But on the inside, I 
you're frightened. It's not a nice place to be. And I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally. It's hard to put into words. You're in constant fear of your life. That's... I think that's why I... I got into so much trouble when I got back. Because I was in the mind frame of, well, just come back from a place where everyone wants me dead. So to, so to die around here wouldn't be such a bad thing. When I was a kid, like, I'd, I'd always watch all the documentaries of the Second World War and the First World War and the Falklands. I was born just before the Falklands War. Uh, that's probably why I, I, I'd like to have been a soldier. So much seeing all the troops coming back to the era of celebrations and that. I don't suppose I looked in too much depth, but you used to see what the media would show you, and it would all look good. I class myself as a pure loyalist, I, I really am. I love this country, there's no place on, on earth I'd rather live. I, I'd never live anywhere else on earth than England, I think it's the finest, most, most beautiful country on earth. I love basic training. It took me back to my childhood when I first joined. Just running around in fields and that. It's brilliant, I loved it. In my eyes, I was going to be in the army for 22 years. That was it. That's all I could ever see me be. I was in uh, 2001 when I joined up. And in hindsight, which is a brilliant thing, I would never have signed that contract if I'd have knew he'd have fucked my head up like the way it has. I was born and bred in Salford, just before the war, 1931. A very poor working class family. Didn't have much of an education. I left school when I was 14 years. I became an apprentice bricklayer and went to work with my father. My whole life revolved around Manchester United, Manchester City. And if I had enough money to go and have a drink on a Friday night, but that was the life that I lived. When I was 19, I joined the army. And after a very brief cursory infantry training, I was sent to Malaya. Deep in Malaya, British security forces pushed on in their long fight against the terrorists. In Malaya, the British, whatever their desires to foster independence and self-rule, were in a position only to meet force with force. I could have told them that I was going to Timbuktu, because I don't think I'd have been farther than the Manchester Ship Canal before. Retrospectively, I know exactly why I went to Malaya now, because it was, and probably still is, the world's largest rubber producer. It was a British colony. It was under threat from what used to be called the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army that was formed to fight the Japanese during the war. In 1948, it became the Malayan People's Anti-British Army because they wanted their independence. They started killing the managers of the rubber estates and the tin mines and killing the local business people, the European business people, that is. So myself and quite a few hundred thousand others went to put a stop to it all. And I went through quite a few unpleasant times. 
I saw a great deal of violence. I was involved in a lot of violence. I meted out a little bit of violence. I saw some of my friends die hideously. I spent 13 months and never had one day off. I just did what I had to do. Instruction in ambushing is another part of the training course. Communist bandits are presumed to be nearby, so the East Yorks go into action. I would simply be told by my immediate superior, we're going out at 4 a.m., be ready. So at 4 a.m., I'd be ready. Careful guard is kept as Corporal Foster searches for hidden weapons. Although the Reds are gradually being suppressed in Malaya, there is still much to be done to restore order, but these are the men to do it. We would set up an ambush on a, on a known track, where we with the track that the terrorists would use. We would sort of lay in wait for them coming, um, and then try and, like I say, catch them, kill them, do whatever needed to be done. Are you a clerk? Do you work in a store? Can you drive a car? If yours is a similar job, your army experience can help you to improve it. I left school early and didn't actually get my English qualifications, GCSEs, etc. I've never been the type to sort of sit behind a desk. It's never really been comfortable with me. Went to the recruiting office, undenied about what I wanted to do. You'll be working with the most modern equipment, such as forklift trucks, and the conveyor belt system. Signed up, did my basic training, and I really enjoyed it, really, really did enjoy it a lot. It just seemed like an obvious progression. It's three square meals a day, pay in your pocket, job for the next 22 years, no problems asked. We were informed we were going to Bosnia on the former Yugoslavia, as it was then. Um, peacekeeping duties with the UN. We were to move into country, and then we were to relieve the Royal Welsh Fusiliers from Garajda, take over their vehicles, and move into the area of responsibility, different checkpoints. Basically, this meant you just go on guard, you come off guard, you eat, sleep, go on guard, come off guard, and that's pretty much it. You were sent over there with the weapon to do a job. And that makes you a target. And you don't realise that, especially when you're wearing blue. You still think that the normal rules of engagement would apply to you. If someone shoots at you, you shoot back. If you feel threatened, you're entitled to defend yourself. It was not when you're working for the UN. Rules are different. You're peacekeeping. And it's all, isn't that what police are for? Well, no, apparently not. You are a policeman, and you're, you're judged as such. But if someone wants to shoot at you because you're helping someone you're not supposed to, in their eyes, that's their prerogative. You can't fight back. You spend a lot of time sitting on your hands waiting for something to happen, to go observe and not do anything about it, because you can't. Um, I think that was the most frustrating. It was like you trained so hard to do a job and when you got there, you weren't allowed to do it. Freedom of movement patrols were funny. In the back of the wagon, all you, you see life through a little perspex square. You can see trees going past, and then you stop. And you can see a bloke with an AK or an RPG walking up and down the side of the wagons, and you're like, all right. Occasionally you get stopped and searched. I mean, you're British forces, and you've got all this kit, grenades, bullets, guns, machine guns, you name it, and some bloke with an AK and a bobble hat on gets to tell you what to do. You just get out of the wagon. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like Benny with a gun. <laughs> it's like, get out the wagon. Why? I want to search your wagon. So, like, no. And then the officer comes out, all right, get, get all your kit out. So you're getting all your paperwork out. Because this bloke with an AK and a bobble hat says jump. And you're like, well, sod off. 
And that was, it was frustrating and, and humiliating. Manchester's oily ship canal to a tented camp on a river bank. River runs deep, river runs dark. One road there, one road back. Leaf like dapples a mountain track. Then all out attack. Buds like bullets, flowers like flack. River runs thick, river runs fast. It was on the 19th of June, 1952. The boss called for volunteers to carry out what he described as a dangerous job. And myself and 12 other guys said, we will go and do this. We left the metal road, went into the jungle. The corporal he said, you go first. I said, OK. And the rest of the guys were just sort of spread out at the back of me, like you do, like we'd done hundreds of times before. Nothing out of the ordinary, no problems. I was at the front in a little armoured car, and then I saw a guy chopping wood. He looked directly at me, and he lifted his axe eye. it would appear that all hell was let loose. They walked right into an ambush. They just aimed a fire at the lot of us. There's nowhere to go. Somebody was blowing a bugle, but I've learned since that the Chinese pass all the med messages with the bugle call. There was what I would call football rattles going, the sort of things that they used to have at football matches. Somebody was blowing whistles. Some of my people were screaming. One guy was screaming for, for his mother. Of the, th of the 13, five of them were killed outright. Four were wounded. Every one of them had been shot low down to disable them. Then the terrorists just came out of their concealed position and shot them all in the head. And whilst this was taking place, we couldn't get a message out for help because the radio wouldn't work. So I, we kept going in a little armoured car. And there was me, there was a Polish guy called Frank Morozak and another lad called Jimmy Lomas. There was the three of us. We got through this lot. We got through this secondary ambush and we found ourselves in a clearing. We got the aerial clear. We sent a, a message saying that we wanted help. We wanted doctors. <laughs> And we wanted stretchers, and the message was, stay away and we'll come and get you. So again, we lit a fag, and I said, we're going to go back, because there's only the three of us left now. The guy that I told you about with the axe, he was lying down, he'd been shot. And our sort of eyes met, and he put his hand up like that. And I knew that if either me or the other two would have opened the eyes to move him, 
would have been killed. So I just, I just rolled right over his head and I killed him. And I've got him to face in the near future. Me and Lomas and a Polish bloke, we sat and thought, whispered and smoked, men without rank, men on their own, one rode out, one rode home. So we drove back into the killing zone, just drove right into the killing zone. River still rolling, turning its stones, mates I drank and laughed and joked with, Mates I deft and jeffed and smoked with are butchered now and their shirts are burning. River still writhing, river still turning. Joe with his eye shot out of his head. He lived for now but meet his end in a Manchester doorway begging for bread. River runs black, river runs red. Some boy wailing his mother's name. Tommy's asleep with a hole in his brain. I found his killer and shot him dead. Tossed him onto a barbed wire fence. Taught him a lesson. Left him to rot. Job done. That brain was absolutely disgusting, barbaric. But then... It didn't affect me one little bit because he and his cr crew had shot and killed my, my, my friends. So, in, in 1952, the fact that he'd been thrown over the bar wire didn't bother me one little bit. But it bothers me now because he was somebody's son. He might have been somebody's husband, he might have been somebody's brother. And he tried to kill us, and we had to kill him, and I didn't even know him, he didn't even know me. And that's, that's the sad part about all this. Job done, till 30 years on. When the dead, like the drowned, float up to the top, one rolled out, one rolled in, and all for what? Rubber and tin, a bicycle tyre and a can of beans, and a river that streams and streams and streams. I was messed up, man. I was messed up real bad. I went literally from being in Iraq on the front line one, one week. A week later, I was at home with all this money in the bank. And I'd got four weeks off. And I just went off the rails big time. I hit the drink hard, I hit the drugs hard. I just wanted to blank out everything I'd seen in the past three, four months. There was times when I was out there, which I ain't gonna go into. Then I went beyond what you'd call my job. I'm not proud of some of the stuff I've done, far from me. But getting out of my head was the only way I could blank it out, even for a day. That's why so many people are suffering with mental health problems nowadays. It's not that the weaker soldiers isn't ever before, it's the fact that after the Second World War, say, just an, as an example, when everyone come home, everyone of a 40 man's age 
had been through it together. They had each other to to shoulder the burden, so to speak. But now you come back, you're on your own. I looked at the faces of the people as they hurried along the platform, but I couldn't see any sign of John. Then suddenly, there he was. It was us two alone. There were so many things I was going to say to him, yet just to hold him again meant more than all of them. The people back home, they just can't comprehend what you've been through. That I don't want to sound mean or nasty or anything to anyone. But they think their intentions are good. But some of the things they ask and say, they're not, they're not helping you. You always get asked the same all stupid questions. They've got that. They've got, I don't know what goes through some people's head. I mean, the amount of times asked, oh, did you shoot anyone? What sort of fucking questions are? When I first come back, I was just getting pissed up and off my head on drugs, and I was just falling asleep wherever I, wherever I was, man. I was, I was too busy getting off my head to realise what that there was a problem. Before I went to Iraq, I got arrested twice. Once was for pinching scrap metal and another time was obstructing a police officer or some petty charge like that. And when I returned home, I was, uh, I was in Westbound Magistrates almost weekly. Violence, mainly. If someone looked at me funny or stood too close to me, or, <laughs> with petty Easter things, and I'd, uh, I'd just lose the plot basically, and I'd, I'd punch him in the mouth first and ask questions later. I, I could have said a thousand words to him, but I always thought, why go go through all that rigmarole when one punch in the mouth will tell him exactly what I think. I was a boy soldier when grenades were pine cones and guns were sticks. I played Churchill's speeches, fought on the beaches as Vera Lynn sang from the white cliffs. And I dreamed the dream of a hero's welcome, of flags and bunting lining the streets. Of drinking for free in every bar, of beautiful women with open arms and white cotton sheets. But instead of klaxons and union jacks came sticking plasters to cover the cracks. And ibuprofen to ease the mind. Without blood or scars or missing leg, you're swinging the lead. Without entry wounds and exit wounds or burns to the face, you're just soft in the head. And the British Army isn't the place for a lying bastard or basket case. What I did, I did for St George and for England and God. Now I sleep in sweat, slaying the dragon or training the crosshairs on mum and dad and shooting them dead. Distraction helps. The beast stalks in the day, kept back by the noise and the light. But after the action, Emptiness falls on the hawthorns and darkness stirs. Then cometh the night.
I have seen things that I'm not comfortable with because I know there's other guys out there that have seen exactly if not more than, than what I have. I feel kind of amateurish talking about it. It's like, you know, the guys in the Gulf that have, have done fighting, that have done warfare. And all I was doing was police work. And as an observer, you know, I'm, I'm kind of afraid in two respects. A, that I'm, I have to remember it and go through it again. And B, is that I'm afraid of being judged for it. You would see things that you would class as atrocities. There was the Black Swan unit, which was a, a renowned unit. It was, you know, it was a death squad. And you'd see them go in and you'd see them come out through the checkpoint. And they'd just smile at you and do this as they drove past. And you're like, well, yeah, cheers, mate. And you'd drive past where they came from a day later. And you could see where they'd been. Corpses, there's kids, there's women tied to trees, slipped from throat to navel. And you know, oh, why? Well, because she was this, or because she was that, or this, this town's this religion, or that town's that religion. And it was soul destroying, and it was like, well, who has the right to do that? It's not something I would do. It's not something I would deem as normal. It's not something I deem as warfare. That's just malicious, unaccountable violence. Through a panel of glass in the back of the wagon, the country went past. Clean your weapon, make camp, drive round, stand guard, stand down. Sit with a gun in your hand and your thumb up your ass when you try to get shot at just for a laugh. 19, fighting the boredom, wearing a blue lid. Then one day, the kid who gets smokes for the lads walks into the woods and never comes back. Then one day, the black swans drive by in a van. A death squad of bennies in bubble hats wielding Kalishnikovs, smirking, running their fingers across their throats, not to be checked or blocked, a law unto themselves. Walk in the valley, walk in the shadow of death, in the wake of the black swans treading the scorched earth, houses trashed and torched. In a backyard, a cloud of blue bottles hides a beheaded dog. This woman won't talk, standing there, open mouthed, it's tied to a tree, sliced from north to south. In the town square, a million black eyed bullet holes stare and stare. Crows lift from the mosque. Behind the school, flesh smoke, sweet as incense, rises and hangs over mounds of soil planted with feet and hands. It's wrong to do it, to take a life in the first place. But to, to see that the way that the, they were just... There was hate behind it. There was malice behind their actions. You could see it in the way things were done. You'd go and check a village and the house was trashed. And there'd be, you know, three bedrooms. With blood trails from each bedroom. And you could see it where it'd gone up the walls where the kids had been beaten and dragged down the stairs. You, you were walking into somebody else's life. And you could see how it had ended. You wouldn't find anyone in the village, but you'd drive out of the village for another five or six miles, and you could see the new hills. Little piles, well, not little piles, you know, they'd stretch for two, three hundred metres of fresh earth. Limbs sticking out, and the smell, you'd smell it before you even got near it. I feel guilty. Because I couldn't do more. And then I feel guilty for for being there, in a way.
I was involved in a lot of violence, probably because of the group of people that I work with. And then suddenly it all comes to an end. You have to come back home and you come home and today you're a soldier and tomorrow you're not. And that's you, finished, end of story. You, you, you go back to work, you go back as though nothing has happened. I went and got a job back at the firm where I'd served my apprenticeship. Others had to go straight on the dole. Others went back to their little grotty two up and two down with their outside toilets. Others went back to their broken marriages. Nobody bothered. Those that didn't get a job, they couldn't, they couldn't go to the labour exchange and say, I've just come back from Malaya and I'm very good with a machine gun. If you know anybody that wants to kill an arm, your man. They couldn't do that. Hopeless, nothing. No support of any kind, none whatsoever. I decided that I would join the police. I was sent to deal with an incident in a part of the city where I worked and an old lady invited me into her home for a cup of tea, which was perfectly normal in the 1950s and 60s. Policemen were welcome then, they were respected. They're not like the policemen that you meet today. There was a series of photographs on a sideboard. I just asked her who these people were, these photographs, and she told me that they were members of her family. She identified each in turn, that son, that son, that son, that son, like everybody has in the home, photographs of the family. And then she opened a drawer in this sideboard and she took a picture from it. Which she polished with her apron. And then she began to cry quite badly. And she pushed this photograph right in front of my face. She said, this is my youngest son, Tommy. She said, he, he was killed in Malaya. And I was with Tommy when he got a bullet in his head. And I'm now looking at this photograph 10, 12 years after. And I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't sort of believe this. She told me that the photograph couldn't be on display because she couldn't look at it. Because she should have been with you when he died. She was very concerned about the amount of pain that he'd suffered. And the photograph had to stay in the drawer because she'd let him down. And I didn't have the courage to to tell her that I was with him when he got shot. I went back the following day and I had a series of photographs of the funeral with it. And then I said I was with Tommy when he got shot. And she was as shocked then as I had been the previous day. I showed her the photographs of his grave. I told her that he hadn't been in any pain, that he, was, he would have died immediately because of the bullet in his head. He hadn't actually, like all the others, he'd been shot low down to disable him before they shot him in the head. And if any good came of all this, I can honestly say that I saw the years lift lift away from that woman's face. She really did show a great deal of relief because she said, now that I know it didn't hurt him, I can look at him. And Tommy was placed in the center of these photographs. 
she was no longer afraid to look at him. But what has upset me then and now, the fact that she lived with no floor covering, she didn't, she couldn't even afford a carpet. And probably everything in the house would have been worth about four quid. Now if Tommy had come and got himself a job, he could have perhaps helped out a little bit. But that is another loss. Not only has he lost his life, she's living in almost poverty. Who cared about her? Nobody. In a jungle war, death comes furtively. From deep in the reeds, from the highest branches overhead. And when it comes, it strikes in the snap of a twig. So five graves, like long evening shadows, are dug, and the five coffins wait in line, varnished and squared off, and the firing party aims for the distance and fires, and all are starched and suited and booted and buttoned up, then ramrod straight, under the shade of a tree, the boy bugler raises a golden horn to his lips, and calls to his dead friends with his living breath. And the tune never wavers or breaks, but now tears roll from his eyes, perfect, as clear as pearls, tears which fall from his face and bloom on his iron green shirt like two dark wounds. Then the world swims and drowns in everyone else's eyes too. How can a man, a soldier who's supposed to be hard, stand there, erect, blowing a bugle and tears on it down his face? Try and imagine that. Just try and imagine that. That's, that is one of the saddest things that I ever saw. That, We crossed the border into Iraq and we made our way slowly but surely towards Basra. I was in a section, seven people in the back of a warrior. You drove with the warrior, the gunner and the commander. And I was machine gunner, first one out the back of the warrior. For the first couple of weeks, we sort of formed a ring of steel around Basra. And the, the mortars was raining in on us, hourly. The first one would land, you'd get in a ditch or anything. And you'd see, say, 50 metres away, the next one would land. 30 metres away, the next one would land. 15 metres away, you'd think, carries on like this, the next one's on my head. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a car crash or you've been mugged, and you get that feeling for that split second when the butterflies are going and everything, where you don't know what's going to happen to you. If you can imagine that feeling 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's what it felt like to be out there. On another occasion, we get sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank. And one of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else. 
are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire, three of a kind, let him fly. And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. In, in total, I think it took 12 rounds. And I, I can still to this day remember as every round passed through. And he was lying there with his insides basically on the floor. And we had to leave him, clear the bank. And he was uh, approximately four storeys high, four or five storeys. And we cleared the entire of the bank, got to the roof. I looked over, the bloke was still there, crying in agony. We come back down and uh, another lad who was in my section literally picked his insides up, dropped them back into his body and he was, uh, he was just chucked into the back of the warrior, never to be seen again. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground sort of inside out, writhing in pain, screaming in agony. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street and out on patrol, I walk right over him, week after week. That's the first time I had it ever ended someone's life. I don't have time to think. It was over in seconds, like, done. But to this day, the only day that goes by that I don't go through that whole situation in my head. Then I'm home on leave, but I blink, and he bursts again through the door of the bank. Sleep, and he's probably armed, possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds, and the drink of the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant, sun-fucked Stone Age land or six feet under in desert sand. But nearer the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. And the first person I spoke to about it was a probation officer. And he said to me, when you get back to the army, he said, tell them that you need some sorts of counselling and some help with your drink. And I got laughed out of the office. I was told, ah, fuck it, now you're gonna go on a basket weaving course. So, you know what I mean? Take the piss out of me. I ain't gonna ask for help again, am I? If you, or you're gonna get ridiculed. It was at that point when it dawned upon me that I wasn't going to, going to do the 22 years as I first intended. <coughs> and I think the main reason for that is because I asked for help. That's, I think that's, 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 that was the end of my career, the day I asked for help. I'd been shot under odd circumstance and critically injured. Shot three times while in service in Bosnia. And I had the round enter in through the top underneath my eye and went through the cheek 
um, blew the corner out the bottom jaw and went down the neck, nicked the carotid artery, uh, bounced off the scapula, bounced off the collarbone, into the top of the shoulder, uh, shattered the shoulder, bounced into the scapula, uh, shattered the scapula, broke two ribs at the back, then went through the back of the right lung, through the back of the heart, sky in the back of the heart, punctured the top of the left lung, right and left side, broke two ribs, left side, third and fourth down, and then bounced off the rib cage through lower diaphragm, scraped my stomach, punctured my intestine, and then came to rest by my kidney. I was a different person before I got shot. I was a young lad, 19, outgoing, happy, the world was my oyster, not a problem. By the time I got out of hospital, I was depressed, I was disfigured, I was injured, disabled, useless. I couldn't do what I, what I wanted to do. There was too many barriers. And then I became self-loathing, I hated myself for, for being the way I was. I'm guilty. <laughs> Life wants to live, and nature will lift and restore the fallen and broken. Nevertheless, a hosepipe snakes through the vehicle door. And you sit there, son, with the engine purring, not to be woken, breathing the fumes until the world stops turning. They'll be harvesting now in parts of the Balkans. Carts piled high, patches of earth unpredictably fertile, fruitful. From blister packs and childproof bottles, you count out the pills swilling them down with vodka and Red Bull. In the butcher's window, a side of beef is precisely a corpse. A slash to the wrists would be painless and quick if the blade was keen and the hand held steady. But you flinch from the thought, having witnessed so much of your blood already. The trees are waiting, heaven sent. Sling a rope from a lime or an oak. How good does that feel, the noose on the throat? And swing from a branch, but the branch won't hold. Then wake in a sweat, with your hands in a knot around Laura's neck. A birthday balloon goes off like a bomb. The car backfires. But you, you're a son of the soil, are you not? So take up your gun and shoot yourself stupid, blank after blank, over and over again, till the hands don't shake and the nerves don't feel. And the crows have risen and flapped from the ploughed field. I know of two guys that have done it. They've taken it through. And at times you sit there and you go, God, I'm jealous. And other times you feel sorry for them. Not for the fact that they're, they're dead. It's for the fact that they couldn't get the help that they needed. I got married about a year after I came home from Malaya. But soon after we got married, I had a terrible nightmare, a most terrible nightmare. I jumped out of bed and smashed, smashed the mirror in the dressing table. I don't know why I did it. I have no idea why I did it. But me and my wife, 
were literally had hundreds of little tiny slivers of mirror glass sticking in us, just sticking in our body, which we had to pull out. There was broken glass all over the floor, which had to be cleaned. But I, I did not relate that to PTSD then. I've only been told since that that was PTSD. I don't sleep with my wife. I haven't slept with, in the same room as my wife for many years because of the nightmares, because why should she lose her sleep as well? I have to sleep alone. I've done for a long time. I had to give up work. I was retired medically unfit because I wasn't able, I wasn't able to go out of the house, actually. It was not nice, it was awful. I lost a lot of weight and became quite unwell. So that set me off on the quest to get help. I, I was backwards and forwards to my GP. Can't help you, Cliff. Don't know anything about it. Never heard of it. Don't have much of this in Cleveland, you know? You're wasting my time. So I got absolutely no help at all. Well, everything that I've spoke to you about this afternoon, I see it over and over again, but it never alters. I see the, the pregnant woman that had been stabbed. I see the people that died in the ambush. I see Tommy Trainer's mother. I hear the sounds of the bugle, the gunfire, the shouting. And the best way that I can describe it to you is it is just it is just like a video cassette. It is identical. It is the same thing over and over again. If there was a slot in the back of my head and somebody had pushed a cassette in, that's what would happen. When I'm asleep, when I'm unconscious, and suddenly I'm sat up in bed, sweating profusely, and the fight and flight bit comes in, I've got to fight for my life or run off, I've got to do something. That part I can't control. But I'm now sitting up in bed, wide awake. And I see a lot of people trying to kill me. And then you have to sort of try and control yourself, but you don't go back to sleep. So the following day, you're worn out, and this is how it affects you. Then after two or three days, you're completely worn out because you've had no sleep. I wrote to the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I was referred to a doctor in Fleetwood, an American guy called Dr. Paul Ross. I spent a lot of time with him. He said, you've got PTSD to a very severe degree and you will never get better because you've been neglected. It's gone too far. And basically, you'll have to get on with it. So I get on with it. And that brain is PTSD. That's what it's all about. Since I've been in Iraq, I have nightmares about random stuff which shouldn't... The thoughts that I have during the nightmares, they shouldn't even be in a young man's head. There's incidences where I've dreamt that my brother's been stabbed to death and I've had to... It's been so real, I've had to literally get out of bed and go and check on my brother. There's times when I've dreamt that I've, I've shot my mum and dad. What, what right? There's, there's obviously something not right there. You, you don't, you shouldn't be thinking that sort of things. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be about a rack. The nightmares I have, it can be literally anything. After injury, I was uh, returned to unit. Now seeking medical treatment up at Catrick and Frimley military hospitals. Um, in 97, I was transferred to a 
TA unit. Uh, remained there until 2000, when I was medically discharged from the forces due to injury and uh, post-traumatic stress. At the beginning, it was, it was really quite turbulent. After my first child was born, it did get considerably worse. Within the first year of her life was one of the worst times that we've ever been through. She cried a lot, and that was very difficult because she'd cry, I'd cry, and he'd get really violent, and it was like, oh, wow, what do I do now? So, you know, sometimes I'd sort of stand and argue, and then other times it was just too scary. Things that I didn't think had, had bothered me that much or had actually affected me now do quite strongly and they affect my family life an awful lot. Um, simple things like children cry, screaming, normal child noises, you know. It all brings back unpleasant memories. The way I felt back then was very, very strong for me. I had a lot of emotion, a lot of things that deeply upset me. That's I can never forget, I can't switch them off. Kids burst a balloon at a party. And I'm, I'm up on the, I'm off, you know, I'm, I'm back living flashbacks, pain and, this is a kid's party. You know, they're having fun, it's their birthday. And there's dad in the corner having a nervous breakdown. It's, it's like, how do you explain that to people that you've, you've only just met and, you know, you're supposed to be looking after their children while they're having a party. Usually it starts off with a lot of shouting. I mean, there's a lot of shouting in our house even now, and uh, something you just have to get used to. <laughs> but it would always start off with shouting. It would escalate quickly, um, slamming doors, usual things that people are mad about. But it intensifies, it will get, it will carry on. Some days it will carry on all day and then all night. And, you know, it's at that point that you kind of know that that isn't normal. Then it'll end up with throwing things. He has held my throat until I couldn't breathe, and then he stopped. Um, you know, he, he shoving, pushing. I mean, I can't honestly say he's actually physically hit me. It's come really close, but, you know, that's the time that it's kind of grab the keys and run and take the kids and leave. And I have to do that because I have to protect my children. I have to get them out of that situation. There were times where she was terrified of me. I've never physically beaten her. But I have threatened and I have assaulted. I've never punched her, but I have grabbed her and threatened. I've been overpowering and intimidating to the point where she was in fear of her safety and the children's. And I felt immensely guilty for that. Since I've been back, I've been put in three different mental health hospitals. What's that all about? And I'm not the only one. There's, I know of numerous amounts of people who have either, have either been to mental health hospitals, been to prison, are in prison, and they're all, they're all people who have served in Iraq. I think it's about time the government has sat up and took notice. My GP set up a meeting with a psychiatrist and that was uh, June 2005. The first time I seen a psychiatrist. That's the first time I got diagnosed with uh, PTSD. I rarely go out my house nowadays. If I do go out, I'm constantly alert. If a car pulls up beside me, my heart's racing. <laughs> Palms are sweating and all sorts. I won't answer the phone. I'm scared to go to the front door. 
on bad days, I'll I'll just get out of bed, and start drinking, pretty much until I'm in that out my head that I just collapse and fall asleep wherever I may be. I did receive a lot of treatments prior to discharge for my PTSD and the mental issues that I was trying to deal with. Unfortunately, I'm discharged. I pretty much ceased and dried up. I then got referred for anger management courses. God bless them. Through the local CPN, who's a community psychiatric nurse. Um, civilian, basically, with no concept of military etiquette traditions, protocols, not a clue on PTSD. Just naturally bracketed as aggressive temper. Um, so I went through my anger management course, came out a reformed person for all of three days. Um, had another breakdown, and it basically went up and down constantly for about six months. Into the period of having my second child, I was the one sat there going, oh, well, that's classic PTSD, because I'd read it on this website, you see. <laughs> and he, he, you know, we kind of switched roles then, because I'm sat there going, and I kind of became his jailer, mother, nurse, and everything else. It wasn't a comfortable role to take, but it was one that was necessary to keep him on an even keel. Fortunately, my wife is one of my biggest saviours. I really couldn't function without her. Not for the fact that I couldn't do anything on my own. She's just, she's everything. You know, I confess my sins, tell her my fears, explain my emotions, share my nightmares. And she doesn't have to understand, she just has to listen. And she does. He, he does care. He, ca he cares about, obviously, what has happened to him. He cares about, you know, what he has seen. And in the military, there are blokes who, who don't care. They don't, they, you know, they've seen awful things. And they get up and they live a normal life. And they don't care about it. They're the ones that are scary, not Eddie. <laughs> I'm glad I, I stuck with it because I know now that I wouldn't. I don't think I'd ever leave now. I don't think I'd, I don't think there's anything now that I wouldn't stand up and go through with him. After the first phase, after passionate nights and intimate days, only then would he let me trace the frozen river that ran through his face. Only then would he let me explore the blown hinge of his lower jaw and handle and hold the damaged porcelain collarbone and mine and attend the fractured rudder of shoulder blade and finger and thumb the parachute silk of his punctured lung. Only then could I bind the struts and climb the rungs of his broken ribs and feel the hurt of his grazed heart. Skirting along only then could I picture the scan, the fetus of metal beneath his chest, where the bullet had finally come to rest. Then I widened the search, traced the scarring back to the source, to a sweating and exploded mine, buried deep within his mind, around which every nerve in his body tightened and closed. Then, and only then, did I come close. I've grow, grown up watching war films and Rambo and all that. But the reality is a whole world of different. You, you, I don't think you can ever fully prepare yourself, no matter how much training you do, for the stuff that, that you see, and the actions that you take. Being out there made me realise how cheap life is, and it can get snapped away from you like that. And it's not a nice thought.
before all I know, that bloke was robbing the bank to feed his kids. I guess we'll never know now. You see, when you think of those that died and those that got wounded, and those that have died since, they were all... They were all like me, they were all sort of uh, nothing people, really. Just ordinary working class people that come from the sort of the slum areas of Manchester and Salford. And that's all, that's all they were. They were sort of... Who, who cared about them? Nobody cared. Nobody cared about them when they come back. Nobody cares now. There is days when I f there's days when I think that I'm nothing but scum. There's days when I can't even face the world. <laughs> 